We're continuing our series, Where is Your Faith? Today we're talking about the ingredients of great faith. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up, because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Amen. Ingredients of great faith, of great faith. I have a chart that I'm going to show you just to showing a statistic that happens when, when we apply faith. The levels of, of determination that are required. We apply something, we think that it should be rewarded just because we decide that we want to do it a certain way. Here's a chart of 100 law school graduates, and this is the bar results. Of 100 graduates, 75 pass the first round of exams. That's a 75% success rate. Of the 25 applicants that remain, 12 pass. 48%. You notice the percentage decreases with each round. The third round of testing, that means of the remaining 13, only three pass. 23% success rate or pass rate. And of the remaining 10, the remaining 10 never pass or never retake the exam. Interesting statistic. One in 10 graduates never pass the bar. They have other options. They have research, there are other options within their profession that they can work in. But imagine going through all of that and getting to that final phase of testing and you miss it. One in 10. Now this statistic goes back to our parable that we talked about earlier relating it to the soils. In the soils, one of four soils produced a crop. Only one of four. Remember the first one was on the wayside and the birds came and they ate the seeds. Now this indicates the word. As you know, the sower in this parable is God. The seed is what? The word. The soil is the hearts of men. So when the word is sown, it's sown into our heart. But oftentimes, the, Satan will come and snatch it away. As soon as the word is spoken, somebody can speak good to you, and if you don't have the faith to receive what is spoken, then it's lost. Some things have been spoken to you, and you may have lost it because you didn't accept what was being said. It was snatched away. Even though it was a good seed, it was a good word, somehow you lost it. The second... Again, the same seed was there. The soil was different in every, every situation. The second one, the soil received the seed. It sprang up quickly. But because it did not have depth, that means the sun came and it scorched it and it withered away and died. Now these are the ones that received the word of God. They're excited about the word of God. They're enthusiastic. They're passionate about it. But as soon as the wind blows, or uh, something happens as adverse in their life, it takes them away. They lose that word that was spoken. Quickly received, but quickly lost. The third, the seed was sown on the different soil. This soil had within it thorns and briars and rocks. And because it could not penetrate that, it choked the seed. And it could not receive the word. Now, this is the, the thorns and the rocks are your environment. That's what you live with. Those are things around you. Those are things that tend to choke away the good that you're trying to do. You have a lot of ideas. You have great passion. You, you desire to go a certain direction, but then the ones around you can choke out your dream. It's called dream busters. 
Those are people who hear what you have to say and they've got something to say against it. Yeah, I know it sounds good, but I don't know. I would, I would say look into it, you know, because my cousins, brothers, friends, neighbors, relative had did the same thing and it didn't happen. They was, I'm just saying, just saying, just saying. So you have to be careful the environment that you're in because it can choke the seed that was meant for you. And oftentimes we want to go and share our seed with everybody. That used to be me. I wanted approval from everybody. I want to talk about what I want to do because I, I need approval. You want them to say, yes, great, get, good, good job, go for it. And we need that approval. But sometimes the seed just needs to just rest in the soil and allow God to nurture it. You have to have faith and believe that it's a good seed. But our environment will choke, will choke that seed. And then the last one, the fourth one, is the good soil. Those are the ones who receive the seed in a patient, in a willing to rest and allow God to complete the work that is done in them. That's the challenge. Of the soils that we saw in the re report with the exam with the law school students, one failed four times or three times, but the fourth time they would take the exams, they didn't take the exam. That means the fourth round of testing, most students choose not to retake. And they choose to either not to retake it or just assume, decide they're not going to ever study that profession. See, faith requires that you go through these obstacles because the first round of testing could be that, that, that seed that fell along the wayside. The second round of testing could have been the soil, the stones, the thorn. Third could have been the fact that it was not deep enough. So that, that last round of testing could have been the one that made the difference. And when we go through our life, there are going to be different rounds of testing. You all are going to go through, we're all going to go through those rounds of testing where we're going to decide, is this really meant for me? Because it didn't happen the first three times, the first 10 times, <laughs> you don't give up. I'm reminded of in 1991, this guy had the greatest day of this guy's life. 1991, the guy's name was Maxie Filer. In 1991, he passed the bar exam. And he was so elated because this was his 48th time taking the test. Can you imagine the excitement? 48 times taking it. He had two sons. When he first started to take the bar exam, his sons were in elementary school. His sons graduated high school, college, went to law school, passed the bar, and he was still testing. But after 47 times, how do you have the courage and faith to keep going one more time? Maybe the 10th time, maybe the 12th, but 47 times. That's great faith. Because sometimes we think that if it doesn't happen the first few times, it's not God's will. It may be God's will that you persist until you get it. Amen. Great faith does not stop because of difficulty or because of issues, or because of a lack of support or a lack of finances. When you have faith, you believe that God is in it, you continue to persevere. You find a way to just keep going. Amen. It takes great faith to continue in a relationship 37 years. And it's been easy 37 years, the easiest 37 years of your life probably. No, it's, it's difficult. And the same challenges that they go through at 37 years, someone's going through their first round of challenges, their first round, and it's just too much. It's too overwhelming. Oh, I just can't put up with this. this is, I can't deal with this. Here's the interesting thing. If you can't make it through here, you're going to repeat it again. Yes. You're going to bring everything you had into the next one. <laughs> So either you pass this one and you go to your next round, or you're going to continually go through it and, and, and fail it and go through it again and again. At some point, your faith tells you that you can make it through this. If someone else can do it, why can't you? Why can't you do this? It's, it's difficult. It doesn't mean it's not God's will because it's difficult, because you don't get the support that you need, or because you don't like the way it makes you feel. you got to go through the storms, through the trial, through the tribulation. The Bible said there's a great cloud of witnesses. That means those have gone through before us, those have passed on. They're looking down from glory and saying, get up and let's get this thing going. Yes. Because they have done so much more with so much less. And here it is, we've got more available to us than ever, and we can't even take the next step. 
We struggled. They have marched and fought and did everything they could to get us this far. Now we can't even face the, the tribulations that we're facing now. So what happens to the next generation? Because the faith that they had took us to where we are now. So we have to apply that same level of faith to move us on. Our world right now is facing a faith challenge more than anything else. We've lost our faith. Somewhere over the years, we've lost it. We used to believe, we had this resounding faith that, that God was able. But now we've misplaced our faith. We've taken it away from God and placed it into every place else. Financial blessings and physical well-beings are the will of God for his children. God desires that everyone is well and everything goes well with you. But there are conditions to the blessings. The first one, the first condition to God's blessing us, this is your ingredient of great faith. The first one is humility. It requires us to be humble. To get to any place and get through it, you've got to surrender yourself. No matter what it is, you're going to go up to a certain point, then you're going to, you're going to hit this, this, this hurdle, and that hurdle is self. That's the first encounter you're going to face is you. And some people cannot get past themselves to get to the next place because for them it's too, and everything goes back to their condition of how they want it to be. I, didn't, I don't want to put up with this. This is not right. I don't like this. I don't like them. They don't like me. Whatever the issue is, it's a selfish motive. So we got to get past that. Humility means, number one, denying yourself. Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, that's the first thing. God looks for humility first. We got to humble ourselves. Before we move forward, do a self-check on humility. Check your dipstick on humility. And if you're running a little bit low, then you've got to surrender that pride, become more humble. It's God's will. Deny yourself. So many people are trying to learn the tricks of the trade, but they never learn the trade. We're so busy trying to find the shortcut for doing things, we never learn how to do it. Humility means sometimes you just got to go through all the steps. You just got to do it the long route, just like everybody else do it. There's no fast way around it. You just got to go through it and, and, and do it. Amen. Humility, James chapter 4, verse number 10. James 4 and 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Amen. If you humble yourself, God is watching those that are humble. And if you're humble, he says, I will lift you up. Here's another one, and looking at Luke chapter 14, verse number 11, what Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Beautiful. Humble yourself, and God exalts you. It says that he who wants to be first must be yeah. least, right? He who wants to be served must be willing to be servant of all. It starts with humility. So often people want to go ahead and jump up to the head of the table. They want to be the first, but they don't want to serve. Humility means that we stop, we decrease, so that God can increase. So humility means humbling ourselves, and then we exalt the Savior. We exalt Jesus. We put him on the throne. We get out of the center, and we put him in the center. Now everything does not revolve around us. It all revolves around him. That's called theocentric. Feel God-centered. Everything you do revolves around him. Egocentric means you're in the center, and everything revolves around you. We should put him back in the center. So that requires great faith. Great faith is like having great strength. You build on what you have. If you want great strength, you build on the strength that you have. Great faith, you build on the faith that you have. No one else can do it for you. It requires you to do the work. We were talking about that, that bar exam. Here's what it requires to pass the bar. I was looking at some of the requirements. They recommend that prior to taking the bar, if you have a bar date, set nine weeks, nine weeks prior to the bar exam, nine weeks out, you start your intense study. They recommend that you don't work, that you set aside everything that you can and devote six hours a day to studying. And then the last two weeks, you study the laws of that particular state. But that's an intense effort. Now, if people are not willing to be humble enough to put that much time in, that tells you what the result is going to be. 
Because you have to humble yourself and decide that everything else you've got to put aside, all of your activities, all of your pursuits, you've got to put those aside, and now you have to take up this banner of determining that you're going to accomplish what you set out to accomplish. It's not easy. The ones that don't pass the bar, not that they're less intelligent, it's just that it required more than they may have been willing to give. If they can go through undergraduate and graduate school and complete a law course, they can pass the bar. So the trip up is not because it's too difficult. If everyone else can do it, they can too. So it becomes as one of these areas today, are you determined? The first one is humility. Humble yourselves, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, right? But, but faith alone can't get you there. Faith without works is dead. So no matter how much you believe in God for it, you still have got to put in the time. It's like swimming. Some, some, of, some of us don't swim in here. No. <laughs> I always tease them about swimming. <laughs> some of us don't swim. Now you can read about it, watch YouTube videos, attend swimming events, subscribe to Swimming Magazine, <laughs> but if you don't get in the water, you're not going to be any better. You may have all the knowledge about it, but at some point you've got to work. You've got to get in there and you've got to apply everything that you know. And that's the struggle. Faith means not just believing. Faith means getting out and doing. We've, we, we, we've said faith without works, right? That you can have all the faith, but if you do not have works, you still are going to be worthless. Nothing is going to happen. So you require humility. The second thing it requires is obedience. Obedience. You have to learn that you have to just follow the rules. And I'm not sure if you like me, rule breaker for so long. I believe my, my thing was I don't break the law, but I will break the rule. Yeah, that was my little trendy thing. Yeah, I don't break the law, but I'll break the rule. But I found out at some point you just got to follow the rules. There's no shortcutting. Sometimes you just got to follow the rules. That requires obedience. And it's hard to obey because when you have to obey all of your life and told what to do, you don't want anybody to tell you what to do anymore. I've listened. Now you're your own person. Going back to that pride thing. You don't want to be told what to do. You want to set your own rules. You can live by your own rules, your own standards. And after a while, you find out, is that really working for you? Because I find that there are rules that govern everything. If you want to learn how to be successful, there are rules to success. There are also rules to failure. Which ones do you choose? If you want to learn how to do things correctly, you're going to learn how to follow the rules. That means being obedient. Being obedient. Psalm 51. You do not desire sacrifice. This is what David was saying. King David, after he had, had broken the rules and lived life on his terms, he found himself in a bad way, and he wanted to recommit himself to God. And he prayed in Psalm 51, the most amazing prayer. If you want to see what repentance is really like, read Psalm 51, where David just pours out his heart to God. He said he knew that he had erred, had erred and he's saying, God, against you and you only have I sinned. And he's just saying, wash me. He's talking about being a sinner from when he was born, and he's just really pouring out and confessing his love for God. And then he closes this way. He says, for you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. We can come to God with pride, and we will pray with this sense of entitlement, and we won't humble ourselves. We will not have this desire to want to really follow him. We really come into him because we want favor. We're not willing to obey and do what God is requiring us to do. We're not obeying all of the commandments. We, we obey just a few. Because nobody's perfect, God. You know, nobody's perfect. And we make these excuses for our shortcomings. And we come to God, but we're not willing to obey and do all that God requires, as if God does not know. And we expect that God's going to bless mess. We know it's not right. We don't have it together, but we're going to pray. I miss it all. I'll, I'll do all of these things, God. In other words, we'll sacrifice. God, I'll come to church more. 
I'll read more. I'll give more. And we believe it's a sacrifice that God's looking for. He's looking for that broken and contrite spirit. When the man that was praying, there was two men praying at the altar, and one was proud, and he was boasting about all the things that he does. God, thank you that I, I, give, I give my goods, I tithe. He talked about all these things. And then there was a, a tax collector here. He says, God, and I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector over here. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not, I'm not like him. And he's just, he's boasting about his goodness. And then there's a the tax collector over here who would not even raise his, his, his eyes up to heaven. But he beat his chest and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He humbled himself. He knew that he was not right. But God doesn't want us to be perfect. It's not perfection that God is seeking. Out of all of our best, all of our works will not get us to heaven. You're not going to be able to work your way into heaven by trying to be good. It's that broken and contrite spirit. Every day you'll fall short. Every day I'll fall short. So we come to God repenting and, and on our knees and humbly ask God, God, forgive me. For I know I've fallen short. I know I've broken your heart today. And when you come to God and you're humble, meekly kneeling upon your knees, God doesn't hear your words. He hears your heart. Because when you're trying to give God lip service and trying to just tell God something that sounds good, but the confession of your heart is not truly for him, God knows that. Because you're going to go out tomorrow and do the exact same thing that you did and come back to God and just th throw yourself down again. It's not the right heart. When you're broken before God, let me tell you what broken means. If anybody ever watched uh, someone train an animal or train, I'm watching them train horses, the more broken an animal is, the more commands they will follow. There was one horse that, that he, was, he, followed, he had trained him to the point where it was over 50 commands. And while he's riding him, this, this, he ride without a bridle or without a saddle, and this horse, just a, a nudge, just a simple word or a sound, and the horse responded to these simple commands from its master. When you're broken, you respond to the commands of your master. It's not the voice out there. You just, one thing is said, and suddenly it brings correction back to you because you're listening to your master. And everything that you do, you're guided by the voice of your master. That's what keeps you in line. Humility means that you're obeying the voice of the master. We'll stray, but when you go out so far, suddenly something reminds you and you tend to go back because there's a voice, there's an unction in your spirit that brings you back to where you need to be. That's obedience. But if you stray long enough, eventually you'll, you don't hear that voice anymore. And that's the danger when you no longer hear God's voice. When you used to be close to God and now you've, you've gotten out there. I talked before about the radio station that here... There's a certain frequency, and you hear the, what you, your station now, but if you venture outside of here, and you go far enough, it'll pick up another, another station, same frequency. And you think it's the same station because you're still hearing it with clarity. But you venture so far away, you, you're now picking up something else. When you venture away from God, it doesn't mean that you don't hear anything anymore, but it's not the voice of God. When you're obedient, you stay close to him. And when you're close to him, you're still attuned to his voice. But as you start straying away from him, you hear a little bit less of him, a little bit less of him. And then another voice starts coming in. And that voice of reasoning sounds good to you. You like it. It's working for you, but you are missing it because it's not the voice of your master. So you have to have obedience, obedience. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 22, this is Samuel, when Saul, the, who was the king of God's people, had transgressed against God, and God had given him chance after chance, and Saul kept wanting to do things his way. He believed because he was king, or because he was privileged, that somehow he was entitled to do things his way. We should never outgrow our need for God. We should never become so big that we think that we don't need to hear anymore, that we're not humble as we used to be. So Saul had his last strike, and then Samuel said to him, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Saul had went out and he had, God said, destroy everything, but Saul decided he was going to bring back some of the good of the flock, and he's going to donate that to the Lord. God has said an instruction, 
but Saul decided to read things his way. That's a danger that we can do. We know what the word says. We start reinterpreting the word. We know we could be in church right now. I know some of you out there, you, you could be in here, and you should be in here right now, but every Sunday morning or maybe the, going to the weekend, the voice of God is telling you to go to church. But then there's another voice who says, well, you know, we're still not quite safe. I haven't heard what they say out there. They, they, it's still not quite safe. You've got your reasoning for it, but you, 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 you got two voices. When, when David... I mean, when uh, Samuel said to his people, how long will you waver between two opinions? If God is God, then follow him. If the God of the Amorites is your God, then follow them. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. you got to stop listening to all the voices and decide which voice are you going to listen to. That voice will lead you where you need to be. Woo! It may not feel right, but if you will follow God, he will never steer you in the wrong direction. He will protect you. He'll give you everything you need. You will never have to worry about anything around you because wherever the presence of the Lord is, there's liberty. He will set you free. He'll protect you. He'll guide you. But you got to be willing to hear his voice and obey his voice. Not easy because there's a whole lot of noise that's going around around us that we hear. There's influences that directs us into a certain plan. We have to know that ultimately we got to get back and follow God's plan. So that's obedience. Obedience. The last one, we have to abide. Abide. John 15 and verse number 7. If you abide in me, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now that's a condition. First of all, we have, to, we have to be humble. Then we have to obey God's voice. Then we have to abide in him. That means take a residence in him. That means we're hearing everything is about him. Abiding in him and his words abide in you. I, I was listening to some songs uh, uh, recently. And every once in a while I get into this old school thing and, I, you know, I, I, and I'm stuck in old school for a while. So I was listening to a lot of old school Teddy Pendergrass and the OJs, the Four Tops, Temptations, Al Green. And I was just caught up in that world. And that was amazing how I knew every song. And with every song there was an emotion attached to it. Yeah. You know, when, when, when Marvin Gaye did Let's Get It On, as soon as it's, oh, I remember 1971. I remember the summer. You remember all of that stuff. And then there was Shaft with Isaac Hayes. Am I losing anybody so far? No. And all those songs come out and they bring about emotions. Why? Because I was abiding in there. That's where I was at the time. And as far away as they were, I still remember them. I still remember how they made me feel. When you abide in him, he changes you from the inside. And you know what it's like to feel his presence. And when you really feel the presence of God, you don't want to get away from his presence. You want to stay right where you know that you should be. He says to you, abide in me. Abide in me and then you will bear much fruit. Because God ultimately wants you to be what he sees in you. And God sees all of us as being bearers of great fruit. The fruit that changes the world. It's not you and I. It's what God does with you and I that makes a difference. It's not our burden to change things. God has already determined that if, if you would allow yourself to be the vessel that he uses, God will use you to change the world. Your work is not done until God has finished the work in you. You may have the best profession, best vocation. You may be doing wonderful in your works. But if you're not finished the work that God has called you to do, then will that get you to, to heaven? Because ultimately he wants to say to every one of us, well done. That's what you want him to say. Well done. Not what you did. He can say well done for the things that he required you to do. And to get to there, you got to humble yourself to do what God wants you to do. you got to set aside a lot of you and put aside your will. you got to obey what God wants you to do. To follow his direction. Then you have to ultimately know that God has the perfect plan. You're going to abide in him. Stay in him. Let the word of the, of the Lord come out of you. I mean, when I first started studying scripture and just learning what scripture was like, I had about three or four scriptures I was trying to remember. 
And it was a struggle. One of them was Jesus wept. That was the easy one. <laughs> and I kept trying to get scripture. It's like learning something new. And then I started going a little bit further. And then I had a whole page, a whole page of scripture. And I would just read these scriptures every night before I'd go to bed. I would go to sleep, scripture right here on my, fall asleep by scripture. And then it started to abide in me. And then it started to be two pages and three pages and four pages. And the last one I looked at the scriptures that I go through is like 21 pages of scripture. That's a lot of scripture. I don't make it through them anymore. By the time I get through around the eight or 10, I'm. <laughs> but you want to know how to get to bed, how to really sleep well? You want to know how to sleep well? I get to my scriptures. When I start going through my scriptures, by the time I get to around Job, it's like. <sighs> then Matthew, and before you know it, I'm out. Another one that you buy in the Word of God is to have the Word of God playing in your car. There's all kind of audio. Just, just play it. I know you like songs, you like to hear the, the, the contemporary Christian and gospel and all that, but the word, there's nothing like hearing the word, the spoken word. If you've got to travel, just let the word play. Just let it play in the background. It's feeding your spirit. It's feeding your soul. I told you one of the first words that I got was the one with James Earl Jones. Yes, was, I love that one. In the beginning was the word. It's like Darth Vader in scripture or whatever. <laughs> But it was feeding you. Every day, you have a choice. You can get up. You can talk about how bad things are. You can get up. You can talk about how good things are. Amen. You can see all the things that's not paid. You can see all the issues that's going on, all the things that's unresolved. Or you can know that God has a perfect plan. And every day takes you closer toward his perfect plan. When you're going through it, when you're going through something, you feel like you're alone. You feel like you're isolated. How are you going to make it through this? But God always brings you through. So the question now, when do we give God the praise? Do we wait till after it's done and then we start thanking God? Because if you look back and realize he's always done it, you start thanking God as soon as something shows up. That takes great faith to know that this situation right here is something you're going to give thanks for. You're not thanking God for the situation, but you're going to thank him in this situation. You're going to thank him through this situation because you know that God has not just a plan, but he says a perfect plan. Abide in him. Be humble. Obey his word and continue to walk in faith.